REO Speedwagon is coming to the Appalachian Wireless Arena in Pikeville, Kentucky on February 19th. And here to talk about the big show from REO Speedwagon, Bruce Hall. Bruce, what's going on today, brother? How you doing? Hey, Eli. I'm doing great, buddy. That's good, man. That's good. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. I would like to start off this conversation with where it started for you, man. Where did the musical journey of Bruce Hall begin? Mm-hmm. Well, honestly, uh, it's it's part of my heritage. My my grandfather was my great grandfather was a music teacher, and my grand, grand grandmother on my dad's side of the family was a singer, and she played. My grandmother used to play ukulele and this little organ at home. It was the cutest thing you ever saw. And uh, and my mom, she's a, she used to sing with a group called Sweet Adeline. My father was a clarinet saxophone player. So it just runs in the family. And when I, uh, all my brothers play bass and guitar. So it seems like it's always just been a part of it, of my life. So, but when I joined REO in 19, no, yeah, 1977, gosh, that's a long time ago, 1977, uh, yeah, I, that's when this whole crazy life of mine took off. But I was in bands. I've been in bands since I was 13. <laughs> wow, man, that's crazy. And, yeah, as I understand, you didn't join the band until a little while after they got things going. So how did that start, man? How did you become a member of ARIO? Well, the truth is I was in a band with uh, Gary Richrath before he was in ARIO Speedwagon. Um, we had a band together called Feather Train back in Champaign. And... and uh, there, Gary left to join Ario Speedway. He left other change in Ario, and that was before they even made records. So, but but Gary always promised me that he was going to call me up one day, and he was going to, you know, I, we were going to play together again. And sure enough, he did. And he just gave me a phone call one day and said he called me up. Uh, I was in a, a club in in um, where the heck was I? Charleston, Illinois. They called Ted's Warehouse, and the phone rang during a break. Somebody said, there's a phone call, and I went and took it, and it was Gary, and he goes, uh, he didn't ask me, he didn't ask me if I wanted to join, he just goes, okay, you're coming to California, that's where they lived at the time, you're coming to California, get your tickets, you'll be here, leave it. you're leaving in three days, so you got to pack up all your crap. He goes, okay, <laughs> okay. Nice, dude, sounds like a good friend right there. I was thinking of this, getting ready for this conversation. You know, so many people that start music, they either want to be the lead singer or the lead guitarist, the drummer, you know, something like that. But I think that the bass is a very underrated and just downright groovy instrument, man. And I know that you do a lot of singing in the group as well, but I wanted to ask, what made you pick up the bass? What made you go that route? Well, the bass was, I, I when I first started to play, I, I played guitar. I, I mean, acoustic. That I started on a, an electric uh, guitar. It was a silver tone guitar <laughs> that I got from my uncle. Anyway, um, then the first band I was in, I I was I played the little guitar, but mostly I was just the lead singer, like you just were saying. And uh, and our bass player was he. We discovered that he was so scared uh, in front of a crowd that he just he, a lot of times he. he he forgot to turn his amp on or he, or he play with his back to the crowd. So we kind of had to get rid of him. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I became the bass player of the band and it just felt natural. I mean, I've got big hands and so, and, uh, I was always a big fan of Beatles in the very beginning and Paul McCartney was just like playing these amazing bass parts and it was it's always been fun. I love the bass. I, I don't think, I think it's the best instrument in the band, to tell you the truth. Yeah, man, I gotta agree. That thumping sound is kind of like the heartbeat of the band, you know? Whenever I heard John Paul Jones in Led Zeppelin's Good Times, Bad Times, you know that silent part when it goes, do 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 Whenever I was a kid, that made me realize just how important and awesome a bass guitar can be. Do you have a favorite bass guitarist or just somebody that you listen to and it just drives you to keep getting better and better with your craft? Well, John Paul Jones is one of them. I always thought um, McCartney, I love McCartney stuff. If you ever get a chance uh, on Hulu, there's a thing called 321. It's him. Uh, Paul McCartney's doing an interview with... Uh, What's the guy's name? Uh, Rick Rubin. Yeah, it is amazing. They, 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 yeah, it's great. You should watch that. And uh, 
I have a lot of great Leland Sklar. I like him a lot. I think he play. I like bass players that play. You know, I like funky stuff, but more. I like the m- melodic bass things that kind of complement a song, but kind of have this, their own little kind of cool little melodies to them. Yeah, man. I, for that. Yeah, I can dig that, man. You know, with uh, these special guests like you that I get to interview, I always like to do some deep diving on those people. And I've done a little bit on you, man. And i seen a picture of you, Adam Sandler, and Larry the Cable Guy. What was that conversation like, man? I'd say it was pretty funny. Well, the truth of the matter is that Dan Whitney, Larry the Cable Guy, he's my friend. And... uh when Cars, one of the Cars movies came out, which one was it, Cars 3? I think it was. He invited me and my wife to uh, come to the screening of it out in California. And so that's where we, we, we went to that with him. He took, his, he took his wife and his mom, and I brought my wife. And it was a ball. We had great fun. Anyway, um, Sandler was there, and Sandler was there. And uh, he's, 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 he's a cool guy. I mean, I like Adam Sandler a lot. He's a... He knows REO and he uses our music a lot in his movies. And um, I said, in fact, it was funny. I said, well, man, it's nice to meet you. I said, my name's Bruce Law. I play with REO Speedwagon. And he goes, he goes, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though, man. I also seen a picture of uh, you and Mark Hamill. And now I'm really jealous of that one right there, celebrating Star mm-hmm. Wars Day. And see, talking to you, mm-hmm. man, this is kind of like a little starstruck experience for me, but with all these cool people that you've met, have you ever had like one of those starstruck experiences, you know? Sure. I mean, well, um, I've never met Paul McCartney. I always wanted to meet him, but I met Ringo and I, and uh, who have I met through the years? I've met a lot of great people. Um, nobody that, you know, I'm not afraid to meet people and nobody that makes me, you know, my knees shake or anything, but, um, I, I just, I, McCartney would probably make me, uh, I'd probably, you know, forget how to talk, but <laughs> tell you the truth. But the, what are you talking about with Mark? Mark is, it, Mark is, I knew Mark before he became Luke Skywalker. He, his wife is from Champaign. She went to school in Champaign, Illinois. That's where I'm from. Mary Lou. And, uh, she met Mark when she first moved out to California. And uh, she was a dental hygienist, a dental assistant, basically. In the, in a, and she met Mark when he was he was just a struggling young actor. And, he, and they, they hit it off and became good pals, and then they got married. Anyway, when I first moved to California, Mark was just working on a new movie called Star Wars. <laughs> and so I got to, I knew him before he was, before he came, became Luke Skywalker. And uh, he, yeah, he's my buddy. He's my pal. <laughs> that's, that's cool, man. Not many people on Earth can say that, that they're friends with Luke Skywalker. So uh, congratulations, man. That's, pre- that's pretty cool to say. And, and, you know, speaking about cool stuff, I also yeah. wanted to ask you about this. I think that it's awesome whenever, you know, rock stars use their influence and earnings for good things. And I saw where you donated $76,000 for cancer research. And, man, I just thought that that was such a beautiful thing to do. And I was wanting to ask you about that. Why is that such an important Important cause. What made you uh, do that? Well, um, our son, my wife and I, we, our boy Tom, he had testicular cancer, and um, when it hit him, thank goodness we have a good. He, he's not afraid to come to us with any kind of problems or talk to us about anything. So we have good communications. I'm afraid that it, this is very common with young men, this cancer, and and I'm afraid a lot of them don't talk to their parents uh, Mm -hmm. openly when it comes. And so, but we were lucky with Tommy and he, we got him, he said something hurt and we got him an appointment. He went to the doctor and sure enough, they confirmed the fact that it it was cancer. So that was on a Tuesday and on Thursday he had surgery and they removed one of his testicles and then, and then he ended up going to the Moffitt cancer center and down by Tampa and which is a great place. And that's where we did some fundraising through, uh, with some of our friends who make a wish and all this, we donated, we got some guitars and we auditioned or auctioned off some, uh, tickets to shows and things like that. Anyway, we raised a ton of money and we gave that money to, uh, the Moffitt cancer center, mostly to our Dr. Spies, who is Tommy's doctor. So he could do more research and, uh, 
but yeah, it was the right thing to do. And uh, Tommy's uh, he's to- totally okay now. So that's such a blessing. You know, we made it through that one. I'm happy that it worked out for your kid that way, man. That really is a blessing right there. And like you said, not a lot of young dudes like to talk about that. And I think that that's why a lot of folks just don't think about it. It doesn't cross their radar. And it's a conversation that needs to be had because there's many guys out there going through this on a daily basis. What are some ways that people can learn more and also help with this cause as well? Well, if they would like to check it out, they can go. There is a website called uh, Moffitt. It's the Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, I believe you just put www.moffitt.com. And it's 2F, M-O-F-F-I-T. And uh, you'll, you can learn all about it. Plus, this is going to sound strange, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. During this whole thing, our Tommy got cancer. But before that, about a couple months before that, his stepmom who was only 35, got cancer. Um, I forget what time she had, but she passed away from that. And so when Tommy, we found out he had it too, I went on. I went online and I was looking for an alternative to helping him get through this. And I discovered there's a, a gentleman by the name of Rick Simpson. Uh, he's a Canadian guy. And he, he found ways to make <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but you use THC, you use high grade cannabis with high grade with lots of THC, and you make this stuff called RSO. You make oil. I made this stuff myself for Tommy, and it is amazing. It's a powerful medicine, I'll tell you that. But it helps kids, and it helps anybody with cancer. I swear, it it, it helps them heal. It makes them helps them get over it. And the chemo isn't as hard on them. And uh, so, if anybody needs to learn more about that, they can find that online too. If you have a loved one with cancer, this is a miracle drug, really. It helps a lot. Yeah, I've heard that from so many people. And hopefully, uh, you know, as we progress in the future and uh, more people start looking at stuff like that, we can find some uh, more healthy, natural alternatives to, uh, you know, terrible diseases like this. But uh, I know that the last show was uh, postponed there in 2021 and because... You know, 2021 was just as crazy as 2020 in some cases. But myself and the rest of the folks here in the mountains are very excited about the show, man. So what can fans expect February 19th at the Appalachian Wireless Arena? I'm sure we're going to play every song they've ever loved. (laughs) I tell you, we play, we try as hard as we can to put every good song that, well, not every good song, but the ones that they are, they want to hear. Because we know that people, you know, it, it costs a lot of money for a ticket. And you got some people have to get babysitters. And it takes a lot of cash to do all this stuff. So when you come to our REO show, we want to make sure that you leave there feeling like, I had a heck of a good time. So so that's, I think they're going to go home horse. They'll probably sing along with every song. And we love it. I mean, I tell you, I, I still, after all these years, I do, I still love playing our, with REO. It's great. We're pretty good, you know. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, this is going to be my uh, my fourth time seeing y'all live. I think that it is, and I've enjoyed every show, and I'm looking forward to this one. Bruce, thank you so much for your time today, brother, and we'll see you February nineteenth. All right, are you, uh, you going to come to the show? Oh yeah, man. I'll definitely be there. Like I said, uh, fourth time's a charm. I guess. I always love an Ario show. Well, come and introduce yourself. I'd like to meet you. Hey, thanks a lot, Bruce. I'm looking forward to it, man. We'll have a good time. But stay safe out there on the road, brother, and I'll see you in February. You too. Talk to you later.